So you can never escape economists. Uh, but I'll begin with a song that came to me. It's relevant. And I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. Oh, uh, Bob Dylan does it better. But, uh, <laughs> see, it seemed appropriate. Uh, where was, uh, it, it makes the point that, that Jeff was making. I think it's very important. Can anyone remember what they were doing in the year 2000? It's not that long ago, is it? If we work back to 1965, it was the same distance back to 1950, which was the beginning of civilian government in, in uh, independent Indonesia. So really a sh very short period of time, and I, I think it's helpful to remember that. The, the question I've been asked today is, was 1965-66 a turning point for the Indonesian economy? And uh, that's a good question. It got me thinking. And the answer that I've come up with is, well, sort of. So uh, let's see what you think uh, by the end of it. The point is, it all depends what uh, you're looking at, uh, whether you're looking at the economic indicators, policy or policy makers, and we can do all of those. And I'm going to uh, look at four different uh, perspectives uh, today. Now, Pierre von der I don't see him here, but it's his graph, and I apologize for mangling it, but uh, I was doing that in a little bit of a hurry. But it's helpful to give a long-run perspective on where 1965 fits in, in, the, in the longer term, because what you notice, if I can walk across here, is that in 1930, Indonesia had reached a peak. It, it, you then had the Great Depression, recovery during the late 30s up to the eve of the war, and then a catastrophic decline through the Japanese occupation and independence. But by the time of 1965, things were not so much below their peak level, and they were certainly very much better than they had been during the 1940s. So yes, things were crook, in Indonesia in 1965, but if you look at the economic indicators, they were nowhere near as bad as they had been only 20 years ago or thereabouts. We're well within living memory, and, and, and that is important in, in terms of, of how people would perceive the situation. Now, in what I go on to talk about, you'll see how the growth trajectory resumes immediate for the years immediately after 1965, things got worse, and then they start to pick up at an accelerated rate. So by about 1980, which is about here, uh, we're roughly where Indonesia would have been if this trajectory had been continued without all those terrible interruptions of the 1940s. So that just gives a framework for thinking about where we were in 1965 and what happened after that. But in the middle, we'd had these missing decades where really the economy had been going backwards or just recovering from all of those problems. Another way of looking at it, and I think probably the most helpful one from that perspective, is what was really happening in the mid-1960s and with this uh, regime change was not so much a turning point as the last great convulsion before the modern era of growth and development. It was the end of that revolutionary wartime and revolutionary turmoil, and after that, yes, things did change, but it was not any sudden turning point. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the economic situation in 1965 because uh, some of the previous speakers have already painted uh, a vivid enough picture and they were there and I, I was not. Uh, at that time, I, I was uh, still in secondary school. But I do have one memory and I'll, I'll leave, give it to you briefly for the little that it is worth. I'd been following these events, as I think most of us had been, reading the newspapers, the excellent correspondence that, that we had, uh, and Bruce Grant I, I do particularly remember. Uh, so they were mentoring me through 
uh, my uh, high school years. So I was reasonably familiar with the names and who the people were and Nasacom and what was going on. And one morning, and I'm not quite sure whether it was a Saturday morning, but I think it was, I went to the front gate, retrieved the Age newspaper, and there was the headline, something like communist coup fails in Indonesia. And it, I knew walking back from that front gate that something very dramatic had happened. I did not know how much that would be part of my life to, to follow, but there's just that, that memory of that moment, uh, picking up the newspaper and seeing that extraordinary headline. Uh, but to look at the economic indicators, and you've had a moment now to absorb them, uh, they were, the situation was dire, and, and the macro indicators were pretty terrible, but nevertheless, if you focus on 1965, you'll see that GDP per capita in the second line was not too much below the level it had recovered to around about 60-61. It had fallen away about 10%. Economic, the economy was still growing just, but you have to remember that, of course, population was growing at about 2.1% per annum. I don't see Terry Hull. Yes, there he is over there. Our demographers are here. That's a bit of a rough estimate. But if you take 2.1% or more away from your GDP growth, you're in negative territory. And that's what uh, these uh, figures are telling you. You also look at the money supply growth, which was uh, extraordinary. We know, economists know, that the more money you pump into the economy, the more inflation you're going to generate, and that was certainly happening. So you've got triple-digit money supply growth and triple-digit inflation, and our previous speakers told you about uh, wheelbarrows of, of cash and, and such things. Now, that in turn has its impact on the external economy, because if the, uh, the, the local currency is... Uh, uh, inflating at a rapid rate, then it means the currency externally is depreciating at, at uh, a corresponding rate. Now, it's very hard to measure in Indonesia at that time because you had multiple exchange rates. So I've cited the official, which was the base rate uh, for things like uh, government rice imports uh, and, and such things. But ordinary people would not have access to that rate. But most people, and that includes, as we now know, the Australian Embassy, were dealing on the black market. And if you want a market rate, then the black market rate was uh, the one that you looked at. And you see just how it had leapt uh, by 1965 uh, into uh, five digits. Uh, so, so pretty uh, extraordinary. And then the next two figures suddenly dropped down. But that's just because the thousands were knocked off by the sunnering, as it was called at that time. So add thousands uh, to those figures and you see the trend uh, of, of depreciation continuing. Uh, the only other background points uh, I'd make were that the modern sector, of course, had passed almost entirely in, into state uh, ownership, which, of course, meant military uh, control, contended by the communist labor unions, of course. Uh, capacity utilisation was very, very low in most industries because you couldn't get the inputs, you couldn't get the spare parts other than through the black market. And, and uh, so ships and, and trains and, and vehicles laid up all over the place because, yeah, non krong just uh, you couldn't get the parts, they couldn't go anywhere. State employees... Uh, of course, did need, as we've been told, multiple jobs to make ends meet. But, of course, the critical point was, if you were registered as a Pagawai Nukri or some such, you got rations. You got your rations of sundown panga, and you got your rice, you got your sugar, you got your salt. And that was the prime reason, the prime benefit for the family of having a civil servant in the family. In the countryside, uh, particularly in southern Java and Nusa Tenggara, uh, you had poverty uh, and you had malnutrition, later documented in that uh, excellent 1967 article by Napitapulu in the Bulletin of Indonesian Economic Studies. Sorry, 1968. It's worth having a look at. Poor people in Java were not eating rice, they were eating corn or, in many cases, uh, cassava. On the other hand, uh, the situation for the common people, Rakia, was not all grim. Uh, in the cities, and particularly in Jakarta, things were not too bad because as the modern sector melted down, 
there were more jobs in the informal sector. And with the prestige projects of Sukarno in Jakarta, there were a lot of construction jobs and so on. So ordinary people were moving from the countryside into Jakarta and they were getting employment and they could support themselves. So retrospectively, uh, Kampung people looked back at that time and said things were not so bad, actually. Things were good. Things got worse afterwards. That's the memory that people had. But out in the villages, it was very uneven, depending what part of the countryside you were in, whether you owned la had land, whether you were landless, and uh, so on. I'll come back to land again in a moment. So uh, it was an uneven situation, but by and large, for the people, things were not too bad. They were, as I showed in that earlier graph, very much better than during the 1940s. And above all, as Frank has explained to us, uh, people f felt pretty good. There was hope. Indonesia was taking its place... Uh, in the world and out in the villages, there was also hope for the landless that uh, there would, might be land reform in the kampongs. The PKE was helping to maintain popular welfare and look after the people who were not so well off. So Indonesia was muddling along, uh, but it was not a sustainable path. So let me now turn to that paints just. Uh, uh, fills in some of the gaps in the picture of where were we in 1965. Let's now turn to some of the economic uh, institutions. As um, Jeff, uh, I think it was, told us, Sukarno was really hostile to the, to the economy and economists. And that's why most of them that later became the technocrats, they were almost refugees. They were no longer wanted in their faculties at UWI and, and so on. If they were going to teach what we understand as, as economics, they, they would, the only place they could do it was in Sesquad, and that's quite the army academy. That's important uh, uh, to the uh, story. Uh, but the point about Sukarno and most of the nationalists is that at that time the issue was not how do we make the economy grow, but how do we redistribute the wealth. So Indonesian Asi, uh, of course, was, was uh, a prime theme. Nationalisation uh, was, was what it boiled down to. So pretty much as, as elsewhere in Burma and, and later Zimbabwe and so on, you can redistribute wealth to a considerable extent by, by seizures. Uh, but it doesn't do anything uh, if you transfer your enterprises to less experienced managers, and particularly, of course, if you don't have spare parts and so on, then uh, the, the output will and productivity will diminish, and, of course, that's what happened. Um, exports, therefore, stagnate. Uh, oil helps to keep uh, the uh, economy afloat. But um, we have uh, that idea of uh, so, uh, Indonesian socialism, which didn't amount to much. In the end, it, if, if it, there was any substance to it, it was probably the black market. But the other point about redistribution was the redistribution of land. And uh, we know about the Aksi Sapihak, the, the PKI was very strong that there should be land redistribution. It seems to me that the really big thing about uh, what happened in 1965 is it determined that there would be no land redistribution. They're the only option for the land that would be to move to the cities, and that, that was a very important thing. So what happened after the regime change? We have the emergence of the technocrats, a gr very gradual process because uh, the ideological uh, situation was still hostile to these people and they were kept in the back room, note, until 1973, not until 1973 did the main technocrats come into the cabinet. That was eight years after the... Uh, uh, after 1965. So there was no sudden turning point. But on the other hand, uh, the uh, regulations, uh, the foreign investment law, uh, the involvement of the IMF, above all the reduction of the money supply to back to single-digit figures and the reduction of uh, inflation back to single-digit figures by 1969, these were very significant events. The point is, of course, as with any austerity campaign, is it makes the 
economic situation worse for ordinary people in that interim. So you don't get accelerated economic growth, you don't get recovery until about 1969. So therefore, uh, it's not a clear turning point, I don't think, but the consequences certainly did flow. Catastrophic damage had been done to the Indonesian economy, uh, and it did take quite some years to reverse. Only at the end of that first repolita, the first five-year plan, in 1973, and with the oil, the amazing bonanza of the OPEC oil uh, price increases of 1973, does the economy really get into high gear. The thing I'd like to finish with is a counterfactual. Uh, I won't run through all the detail, but one might ask, that we know what the path was that happened, well, what didn't happen? So if the PKE had gained power, whether singly or in coalition, would they really have been able to turn the economy around? There wasn't much left to nationalise. Uh, land redistribution would not obviously have increased productivity. Uh, Oil prices were still relatively low. So who was going to be taxed and how would uh, economic growth have, have been financed? Uh, so I think there's some interesting questions to ask and I don't have the answers to any of them. So the best answer I can give you at the moment is, well, sort of to the main question and uh, I'll leave it to you to make a call on, on, on that last set of questions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.